So it's a pleasure to be here, more of a pleasure because you didn't take more than a minute of introduction. Uh, it's a meticulously well-organized conference and I'm really enjoying it so far. So um, although it's true that I'm interested in public understanding of mathematics, my greatest interest is my own understanding of mathematics, which I'm working on all the time. And I, this talk is going to sort of focus on how I view problems in numerical analysis. Um, and it'll have somewhat of a historical character and then touch up on current research. In some sense, I'm talking about very basic uh, things, but you'll see stability and consistency particularly, but you'll see they have many aspects, and I think many people don't fully understand them and maybe don't use the concepts as much as they could be used to get understanding. So let me get, begin really simple. Um, basically, I'm talking about numerical solution of PDEs, and the simplest case might be the steady state heat equation. So in Northwoods of Minnesota or Michigan, you might have a cottage like that. And here's the floor plan. And to take a simpler problem, we assume that it's zero degrees centigrade all around the cottage, except that you have some radiators at 35 degrees and 60 degrees. And the question is, if you're sitting over here in the cottage, how cold is it? And so we could model that if we assume that the um, temperature has already reached steady state and we set various conductivity coefficients to one and so forth. We get Laplace's equation with some boundary conditions. And then a simple finite difference method, you replace the domain with a grid set and then you replace the Laplace equation with a finite difference equation. So here are the standard five point different Laplacian relating each point to its neighbors. And then you solve, that's now, I did a 20 by 20 grid, so that's a system of 400 uh, linear equations and 400 unknowns, which any computer can solve, and you get a temperature profile like that. If you do it again on a finer grid, let's say 100 by 100, you get something like that, which gives you a pretty good idea of the temperature profile and tells us what we already knew, that if you're not standing right next to the radiator, it's cold as hell in those cottages. Now let me also do a finite element method because I'll talk about those more, but it's very good to have both points of view available and I'll try to do a sort of unified treatment. So here I took a nonlinear problem, the minimal surface equation. So the question is find a graph over this square that interpolates these two curves and has the minimal surface. That's a simple PDE to write down over there. And uh, so we would solve it with finite elements by going to a weak formulation, multiply by a test function V integrate over the domain and integrate by parts and require that holds for all test functions. So you get this weak formulation. And then we do a Galerkin method, which means that instead of looking at all possible u and all possible test functions v, we restrict to a subspace of potential u, uh and some vh, and restrict our, tri our test functions to test functions in vh. That's a Galerkin method, and that becomes a finite element method when you choose your space to be a space of piecewise polynomials that's constructed in a particularly effective way. And if you do that on this problem, you get a nice surface like that. Okay, so these are sort of two model problems to keep in mind as we move towards more complicated problems. Let me just say something about what makes a finite element space a finite element space. It's not any piecewise polynomials. It consists of three things. You take your domain, you triangulate it, or in three-dimensional, you cut it into tetrahedrons or simplices or maybe other shapes. And then on each little shape, you specify a space of shape functions, which might be linear functions or quadratic functions or cubics, or maybe something more complicated. And the key thing is you also specify a set of degrees of freedom associated with the vertices, the edges, the faces, um, that tell you how to paste the function from uh, element to element that specify the amount of continuity. So this is a space of this one here. This is piecewise quadratics um, that are use these degrees of freedom resulting continuous but not C1 piecewise quadratics. And we do that because those, those spaces can be very effectively implemented. Okay, and uh, the question I wanna talk about is how well do these methods work? And then for more challenging problems, what's necessary in order to get a method that does work? Just to show you that this is not totally academic, I did sort of a realistic, high quality, relatively recent, although now seven year old, computation I took from the group of uh, Dan White and others at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs. 
Here they are talking about a pulse of radar coming in this building. The building is cut away here to show you the reinforcing bar. And they're trying to see to what extent the scattering of the radar is affected by the reinforcing bar inside the concrete. So it's a very multi-scale problem because these reinforcing bars are a centimeter or two in diameter and the building is 40 meters. Uh, and therefore, they ended up using 10 billion finite elements using um, what are called the Nedelec edge elements and face elements uh, to do this. And uh, they did this for 12,000 time steps. So it's a huge computation. And in fact, there is a very distinctive difference between no rebar and rebar. <coughs> and also, to give us a little sense of caution, let me remind you of this. This is, our, this is from the early 90s. Um, this was the case of the Sleipner offshore platform in Gansfjord, Norway. And so it's an offshore oil platform, holds 400 tons of equipment and people. And what they do is they take the foundation, which is these huge concrete tanks you see here. They're filled with air, so the whole device floats. They float it to where they want, and they slowly let in water so it sinks to the seafloor. And what happened is uh, when it hit 65 meters in the seafloor, there was a sickening cracking noise, and the whole thing collapsed and sank down to the um, sea bottom caused a little earthquake, probably bigger than the one we felt today, a magnitude three earthquake, and uh, almost a billion dollars worth of damage. And it was ultimately determined that what went wrong, the reason that this uh, thing couldn't withstand the pressures at 65 meters, after all, we know exactly what the pressure at 65 meters is, there's not, nothing unpredictable in this, very little uncertainty, is that the software that was used to um, simulate these things, these kind of pieces in here, which are pretty big concrete uh, pieces, um, <clears throat> it underestimated the shear stress that was induced at one of these corners by 47%. And uh, they, therefore, they hadn't built it strong enough to withstand the shear stresses that it actually felt. It was a failure of uh, solving the equations of linear elasticity, which is a very, very standard a uh, problem for finite elements, and yet uh, even then using the best uh, commercially available, or at least one of the most used commercially available uh, finite element software packages, they had these huge errors that caused to this disaster. Okay, so now let me get to the topic with that as motivation. So what's the idea of what I call the fundamental theorem? It's something that probably most of you have heard of in one way or another in a course. Well, let's take sort of any problem, what I have in mind is a PDE problem, like on the first couple of slides, or for that matter, uh, on, the, on all the previous slides. Um, and to keep it simple, I'll take a linear problem. Uh, that can be extended in various ways. So we have a linear operator from one space to another. Let's say these spaces are norm spaces, so I talk about um, sizes in them. And then we're given a piece of data, F, which would represent the forces, the right-hand sides, the boundary condition, the initial conditions, et cetera. And we need to find a solution u in the first space such that l u equals f. So OK, that's a super general problem. And I'll assume that usually that we're dealing with a well-posed problem. So given an f, there is a unique u. And what's more, the mapping from the data to the solution is continuous. And now we want to solve that numerically. So what do we do? We choose spaces xh and yh with the key difference that they're finite dimensional, so we can actually compute with them, and an operator lh that goes from xh to yh, and we pick a piece of data fh and yh and so find a uh and xh such that lh uh equals fh. Okay, and the goal is that uh somehow is close to u. At the moment, there's no reason why it should be close to u, because the only relationship between this problem and this problem is that I use similar letters. I put an h on it. But we have to make some hypotheses, of course. So our goal is convergence, which means uh is sufficiently near u. Whatever that means, that's not quite clear yet. We have to make that precise. And the two hypotheses are consistency. Consistency means, roughly, that LH is something like L, and FH is something like F. And then stability. And stability is exactly like well-posedness for the continuous problem. Unlike the other two, it only has to do with the discrete problem. It doesn't talk about the continuous problem. And it's simply that for every FH, there exists a unique UH, 
and the mapping from FH to UH is continuous. And we really have in mind that you have a sequence of problems with H getting smaller and smaller, and then that continuity should be uniform as H goes to zero. And then the fundamental theorem stated in an uh, informal way is that if the discretization is consistent and stable, then it's convergent. So now let's make that precise. It's not hard to do, so we can do it on one slide. So first of all, to talk about convergence, we need a norm that we can measure the solution. So we put a norm in the space xh. But now we have a problem. We have u, the exact solution in x, and uh in xh, and I want to compare them. They're in different spaces. So I have to somehow put them in the same space. So I assume that I'm given a representative uh and xh. For example, in the first problem, the finite differences, x would be a space of functions on the uh, square, and xh would be functions only on the grid, and we could take a representative of the solution by just restricting it to the grid, the, the restriction to a grid function. For the finite elements, it's a little different. For the finite elements, u is again a space of all functions on the square with some smoothness, and uh is all piecewise polynomials in our finite element space, and the representative might be, say, the best approximation of u by a piecewise polynomial in that space. Okay? And then the discretization error that we're hoping to get um, small is that the difference between the representative of the solution and the discrete solution measured in the norm of xh should be small. And if h goes to zero, it should tend to zero, hopefully quickly. For consistency, we need a norm in the space yh. And if we have such a thing, then it's very easy to define consistency. Just take your representative and stick it in your numerical scheme. LH acts on XH, the representatives in XH, so we can look at LH capital UH minus FH, and the method is consistent if that's small. So roughly speaking, consistency error is the amount by which the exact solution, or its representative, fails to satisfy the numerical scheme. So a good numerical scheme should be such that the exact solution satisfies it, or almost. And then stability, well, that's the easiest to define now. That's just the modulus of continuity of the operator that takes FH back to little u uh, the numerical scheme. So we have to assume that it's invertible. The numerical scheme has a unique solution. And the norm of the inverse is the stability constant. OK, now we've given precise definitions. We can state a precise theorem. And it's in incredibly easy. You start with the new, here's the proof, and there's the theorem. You start with the uh, numerical method, LH little UH equals FH. You subtract both sides from LH applied to the representative. Um, <coughs> you pull the LH out in here, or you multiply both sides by LH inverse, if you will. And so you get the error between the representative and the discrete solution is LH inverse times the consistency error. And then you take norms, and so you get the discretization error is bounded by the stability constant times the consistency error. And so if the stability constant stays bounded and the consistency error goes to zero, the method converges. OK, so I claim that's behind essentially every method for the numerical solution of differential equations. And now I want to look at what goes into stability and consistency in real cases. So first, stability, and then I'll go to consistency. So in stability, um, don't you hate that? <laughs> hate people who forget to turn off the thing in the audience. What about the speaker? Um, <coughs> so let me give you the simplest example I can think of of instability that's easier than solving a differential equation, just computing an integral. So we want to compute the integral of x to the 14th e to the x minus 1. So the shaded area, this is the unit square, and we want to compute the area of that shaded area. And we come up with the following numerical method. We remember we give a name to this integral as a in terms of parameter n, so we want to compute gamma 15. And we integrate by parts uh, to get that gamma n plus 1 is 1 minus n times gamma. And when n is equal to uh, 0, then we can easily take this integral, and we get it's 1 minus e inverse, or 0 0.632121, et cetera. OK, so I take 0 0.632121, one, 
and then I take one minus it, and I get 0.367879 for gamma two, and then I take one minus twice that, and I get 0.264, and one minus three times that, and I get 0.02, and it all seems to be going nicely, and we just continue till we get to gamma 15. Here's the next column. That looks pretty good, except if you read down to the bottom of the column, you might be nervous that this one is negative. Then you might be nervous that this one is actually bigger than the previous one. That doesn't seem quite right. But after all, it's in the third decimal place for a numerical analyst. It can't be that important. So then we go to the third column, and it is that important. By the time we get to gamma 15, apparently the area under this curve is 38,460.6. So that can't be right. So what went wrong with this example? I mean, what could have been simpler than that? You can pull out your phone and run it yourself. So what went wrong with this example? Well, there was only one error made on this slide. I changed point six three two one two one dot dot dot, and I threw away the dot dot dot. I made an error of ten to the minus seventh over here. And then I repeat that error entered over here, got doubled here, tripled here, quadrupled here. By the time we got down to here, it was multiplied by fourteen factorial, and that's what explains this huge error. So what's the point here? Well, on the one hand, so this is an unstable algorithm in the sense that if you think of the starting value as input data, then the output value is incredibly sensitive to the starting data. So there, it, it does depend continuously, but the modulus of continuity is huge. So in that sense, this is highly unstable. And what's the origin of the instability? Well, you keep multiplying by something bigger than one, actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger, so it grows exponentially. So that's sort of the simplest kind of instability. What you usually learn in a numerical PDE course is that, and also historically where it was studied, was when you try to solve the steady, not the uh, steady state, but the time dependent heat equation. So let's go back to that heat equation example and um, solve it with finite differences. So it's the same thing I did before with a five point difference operator for UH, but I also use a forward difference operator for the time derivative. And uh, we could ask for the consistency. What happens if you stick the exact function u into this thing? And it's easy to see by Taylor's series that the error is order k plus order h squared. So if the time step k and the space step h go to zero, the error goes to zero. It's a nice, consistent method. OK, and here I'm back in the same situation, different type of graphic, same situation. I have my radiator here, my hotter radiator here, zero everywhere else. and. <coughs> I'm going to um, do the computation here with a 20 by 20 grid and a time step of 0 0.00625. Take the time step much smaller since you, um, it's only order k, not order k squared. And you get that. And it slowly settles down to a, to a steady state. And everything looks perfectly fine, and it's working perfectly nicely. And then I do it again, if I can figure out how to do that. And the only difference here is I take a slightly larger time step. And then you get this, and it also looks OK. But then it starts to look not so OK. And then it looks much less OK. And then it starts to look really bad. And then it blows up. So notice there's a certain similarity between this and the first example with the integral. It started, got off, and then it started to get a little oscillatory, and then bigger and bigger uh, with these huge oscillatory errors. So that's classic instability of numerical PDE. Let's see why that is. Well, it's easy to analyze. Here was our numerical scheme. We, we solved for this guy over here, which is the discrete solution at time level n plus 1 in terms of the discrete solution at time level n. And you get this, the discrete solution at time level n plus 1 is a certain matrix times the discrete solution at time level n. Let's call that matrix G. And here is G written out. Uh, at any given point, it looks, it's 1 minus 4k over 8 squared times v at that point, plus k over 8 squared times the sum of the four neighbors at that point. And now the pro there's a very different situation. If 4 over k over h squared is less than 1, this is a positive number. And here we have four positive coefficients, and they add up to 1. 
which means that the L infinity norm of this matrix is at most it's one. On the other hand, if k over 4k over h squared is greater than one and this goes negative, then the L infinity norm of this matrix becomes bigger than one. And uh, <coughs> so what happens in that case where the time step where 4k over h squared is bigger than one, then what you're doing is you're taking your initial error and you're hitting it with a matrix bigger than one in norm and again and again and again more and more time steps and so it grows up exponentially. So that's sort of the essence of instability. That picture I just described was, came out over 25 years or so, 30 years or so, and here are three of the big milestones in that kind of understanding of uh, stability. So it was Courant, Friedrichs, and Levy in their famous paper in 1928 who were the first people to specifically say, as far as I know, you know, just because a numerical method, a finite difference method is consistent doesn't mean it's going to converge as the time step and space steps go to zero. They took a very easy case to analyze. They had this wisdom to do that. Namely, they took a wave equation where you have a finite speed of propagation and a corresponding uh, domain of influence of the solution. And they said, well, if you don't have the right ratio between your time step and space step, the discrete solution won't sample the entire domain of dependence of the true solution, in which case it's impossible that it'll converge. So they showed that a consistent method might not converge. Then fast forward to 1950, von Neumann was uh, developing the stored program computer. He had access to the ENIAC. He was developing the ENIAC. And he wanted to be able to do real science with this thing to drive its development. And together with Charney and Fjortoft, he tried to move climate science and weather prediction from the hand calculations of Richardson and people like that into the computer age. And they wrote an important paper on it. This was the mesh they used to uh, simulate the climate over the entire North America. This is what you could afford to do in 1950, 200 grid points for the entire North America. It wasn't quite enough. Uh, they missed a hurricane in their forecast. But um, if you read that paper, he says very specifically, it's not enough to put down consistent formulas because small errors that come up from the consistency errors can grow in the course of the computation without bounds. So he was getting to the idea of stability. And that's the paper where they introduced one way to analyze stability called von Neumann stability analysis using Fourier series. By 1956, things had become quite clear, and there was a sort of capstone paper in this area by Lax and Rittmeyer, uh, introduced the famous Lax equivalence theorem. And here you can see very clearly, we give a definition of stability in terms of the uniform boundedness of a certain set of operators, that's LH inverse, and show under suitable circumstances for linear initial value problems, so not any problem like I was doing, but linear initial value problems like the heat equation, Stability is necessary and sufficient for convergence, where one of the conditions is consistency. So the important direction is that stability plus consistency implies convergence. And that was clearly stated and proved for that class of problems. Now let's, OK. So now let me go to finite element methods. Um, so finite element methods really gain a lot of understanding from putting them in the right abstract framework, usually using Hilbert spaces. So let me start out allowing the trial space and the test space to be different, two Hilbert spaces, V and W. And so the problem we want to solve at the continuous level is we have a bounded bilinear form B and an element of the dual space of W, and we want to find U and V such that BUW is FW for W and W. So that's our weak formulation. That looks very different from what I wrote down before, which was LU equals F, but actually it's just a special case of that. If you define L from V to W star using the bilinear form, then this is exactly just another way to write LU equals F. So it fits under the, the general uh, framework I've been discussing. And so for a typical example would be V equals W is H01, and BVW is the integral of grad V dot grad W, and then this is the usual way to solve the Laplace equation with finite elements. So now to discretize, we use Galerkin method or something like a Galerkin method. We replace VH and WH with finite dimensional subspaces. And we replace B with some bilinear form on the finite dimensional level. And we take an FH and WH star and solve the analogous problem. 
This is a Galerican method if the VH is just, if the VH and WH are actually subspaces of V and W, and B is just the restriction, and FH is the restriction. Otherwise, it's a little more general. Um, in that case I just talked about, if we use finite element spaces, we would call it a conforming finite element method. Otherwise, I say it's non-conforming. So this is the kind of method I want to analyze. And of course, our general theory, which applies to any LU equals F situation, applies to this case. So what are the consistency errors and the um, <clears throat> stability constant for finite elements? So the stability constant was um, identified by Babushka in 1971, the famous IMSUB constant. The norm of LH inverses, and by the way, I, now I'm gonna take V equals W just for simplicity. So the norm of uh, LH inverse is precisely one over this inf sub constant. And so if you can compute this inf sub constant and you can show that it's bounded above zero, then you have stability. Um, so this tells you what you have to look for, although it's not always easy to uh, verify the inf sub constant. The one case it's easy is in the case where the BH is a coercive operator, meaning BHVV is greater than gamma V squared. Then the IMSU constant is greater than gamma, uh, and you have stability. In other cases where you don't have coercivity, it can be quite difficult. Okay, so we need finite element methods that satisfy the IMSU condition, so they're stable. Let me give you some examples to show you that it's not so easy to do when it's not coercive. So super simple problem. The Laplace's equation in 1D in its natural form is a first order system. U, prime is U is minus P prime, U prime is F on an interval. Multiply the first equation by a test function V, integrate, integrate the P prime by parts. Multiply the second function by Q, integrate, and we get this weak formulation. And now what we do is we say, okay, instead of using the spaces of all possible um, test functions V and Q, let's use continuous piecewise linear functions for V and Q and continuous piecewise linear functions for U and P. That's what I call P1, P1. And the problem, sorry, uh, problem with P1, P1 is that actually the matrix you get out is singular. So the M sub constant is precisely zero and there's no numerical solution available. So it's completely unstable. You can't even measure the stability. On the other hand, if you use piecewise linears for U and V and piecewise constants for Q and P, which you can because there's no derivatives on P and Q, that works perfectly fine. And you get these two nice curves. The true solution is hidden under the green line. You can't even see the difference even with only 14 elements for the U. And of course, piecewise constants aren't that great, but they're still doing as well as they could. On the other hand, if you increase the space of U's that you use and use quadratics and piecewise constants for P, then you get wild oscillations. So this is unstable again. So it shows you, I mean, it's not so obvious why you should do this, but we're getting a sign that somehow H1 makes, works with things like piecewise linears maybe, while L2 maybe should use discontinuous things. It's not so clear. And now if we do the same problem, but we go into two dimensions, what comes out is interesting and important. Then the problem we have in mind is this one, and that's Darcy flow. I put back the coefficients, permeability and viscosity, and so this is a porous medium flow, and we try to solve this using that same mixed formulation, and we try, well, if we use piecewise linears for both, we get a singular matrix on many meshes, so that's no good, just like in 1D. But if we use piecewise linears for U and piecewise constants for P, it worked in 1D, but it doesn't work in 2D. It gives you this crazy oscillatory shape. If I cut it across the, the diagonal, I get this crazy jumps in P. On the other hand, there is a set of elements that were discovered that work. These were discovered in the 70s, called the Raviar-Toma elements. They said, don't consider all linears on a triangle. Consider only linear vector fields for U of the particular special form A1 plus BX1, A2 plus BX2. Those are special linear vector fields. And don't put degrees of freedom that enforce continuity of all components. Only put degrees of freedom that enforce continuity of the normal component of the vector field. Use those for U and use piecewise constants for P and you get a very nice piecewise constant approximation of the fluid field. 
So that's something stable. OK, and one more example that is a, one of my, my favorites, I guess, is if you look at the Maxwell eigenvalue problem, which is curl curl u equals lambda u, you solve it with a Galerkin method. I take a case, the unit square, the length pi square, where the exact solutions are known to be the sum of squares by separation of variables. And so I take this mesh. This was suggested by Bofi and Gastaldi. First with 16 elements and 64 elements, 256. And these are the computed eigenvalues. And you see this one is converging clearly to 2, which is 1 plus 1. And this is converging clearly to 5, which is 4 plus 1. And we also get another 5, because it's 1 plus 4. And this one's converging clearly to 6. And 6 cannot be written as a sum of squares. So there is no eigenvalue 6, even though that this method converges nicely to it. So this is an example of converging to the wrong solution. And here's another example. You do the same problem, but you use these meshes. And then you get all these spurious eigenvalues. It keeps getting this thing that seems to be converging to 0. And you don't see the correct eigenvalues. So this method fails completely using continuous piecewise linears to solve this eigenvalue problem. On the other hand, if you use something that's very like the raviar toma elements, but now uh, bx1, bx2 became minus bx2, bx1, and the normal con components became the tangential components, you have no problem no matter what mesh you use. 2, 5, 5, 8, 10, et cetera. And um, again, same thing here. And this is a stability issue, although it's a subtle one to see. Um, but this can be traced to the stability of this method and instability of the previous one. OK, now consistency. <coughs> so consistency, remember, for finite elements, we use as the representative the best approximation in the subspace. And consistency is what happens if you stick that into LHU minus F. But for finite elements, LHUH is just BUH as an operator on VH. And so we take this VH star norm, and we get this expression. So that's the consistency error for finite elements. Now, if we bound that in the obvious way, well, if BH is equal to the restriction of B and FH is the restriction of F, then we can bound this in the obvious way. So for a conforming finite element, the consistency error is given by the norm of the bilinear form B times the approximation error. In the general case, there's another term that's often just called the consistency error, but it's really only a part of the consistency error that measures the fact that BH is not really B and FH is not really F, so the exact solution doesn't satisfy the equation there. OK, so how do you bound the approximation error? Well, typically, you just absorb the bound in B in a constant, and then you have just the approximation error. And the approximation error just depends on the kind of poly piecewise polynomials and the mesh size. For example, if you use piecewise quadratic finite elements, the approximation error measured in H1 will be order H squared. Well, if you use cubics, it will be order H cubed. So just by using nice f fine meshes to make H small and or large R, uh, you get the, the consistency error small. It's a little more complicated if you're using meshes which don't contain parallelograms, but rather contain hexahedra, deformed cubes. So first of all, on plain cubes, the obvious thing to do, or one obvious thing to do, is to take the tensor product in each coordinate direction of polynomials of one variable to get polynomials of many variables. We call the space QR, polynomials of degree R in each variable separately. The problem is you introduce many more degrees of freedom, especially in high dimension. So for example, here's the case of uh, degree 5. To con contain all polynomials of degree 5, you would need all these green monomials. But in order to be able to put, you put the degrees of freedom that we need and so forth, we take the full tensor product. You have to add all these additional monomials of degree higher than 5. Um, which almost doubles the number of unknowns, and it's worse in 3D. So early on, people tried to do something about that, and they introduced these so-called serendipity finite elements, where they found that by changing the degrees of freedom, they could get away by adding just two additional monomials, rather than a, this large number of them. Interestingly, 
That wasn't worked out in more than two dimensions until 2010. Gerard Awanu, we figured out what the equivalent thing is. Let's look mostly at the shape function. We took all polynomials of degree R, and then we added these monomials. What are these? These are monomials of degree R plus 1 that are linear in at least one variable. That's why we added in 2D x, y to the r, linear in x, and x to the r, y, linear in y. Also, we add things of degree r plus 2 if they're linear in at least two variables. That doesn't do anything in 2D, but in 3D it adds some more monomials and so forth. And these, these spaces have the same approximation properties on cubes as the space QR, but much lower dimensions. But then comes up a consistency issue. What about if you're not on a cube, but on a distorted cube, a deformed cube? There was sort of a folklore around that the SR and the QR would perform equally well. But it turns out that's only true if you're on a cube or at least a parallel pipette. But on a generally deformed quadrilateral or hexahedron, QR achieves order h to the r, but SR only achieves order h to the r over 2. And once we realized that, uh, that was done with Bothy and Falk in 2002, we made an easy counterexample. We computed in a sequence of meshes that every element was one of these trapezoids. And if we used QR, we saw a clear rate of 2, while if we used SR, the rate went down to 1. So what is that? That's a matter of inconsistency. This method has much higher consistency error with SR than QR. And actually, this is what was uh, implicated in the problem with the Sleipner um, uh, offshore platform. So here's from a report on the platform. Uh, they reported that one of the major design faults was that the elements were distorted. The angle between the sides was not close to 90, resulting in the 45% uh, underestimation of the shear stress. Now, if you go to Ravier Thomas style elements, elements that you use to uh, study the divergence rather than the full gradient, then it turns out that the loss of accuracy is even greater, is more pronounced. Um, <clears throat> for example, those Ravier Thomas elements, which I liked so much, if you take the analog of those on squares or cubes, the lowest order case is non-convergent on distorted quadrilaterals or hexahedron. And Bermudas and his group came up with a very nice example to illustrate this. He said, suppose you want to solve this acoustic eigenvalue problem here. Take this sequence of meshes, the same one we used before, and compute the eigenvalue with a finer and finer mesh. And it nicely compute, uh, converges 10.3, 10.26 or so. So we think we know the eigenvalue, but the true eigenvalue is pi squared, which is 9.8. So it's another example of the solution is converging, the discrete solution is converging to the wrong answer. But this time it's consistency, like Chang's case, not stability, like the previous one we saw with the curl curl eigenvalue problem. This was an example from earlier in my career. I studied the Reisner Minlin plate, which is an improvement on the biharmonic plate model for thin plates. <coughs> it's, it's a model that involves the parameter the thickness of the plate in a non-trivial way. In the biharmonic, that's just a factor in front. But here, it affects some terms more than others. So you get a multi-scale problem. And the problem with this method is, this is a coercive bilinear form. So any finite elements will be stable. So people just used for both variables, theta and w, piecewise linears. And they found that it converges very well if the plate is thick. This is the red line is t is equal to 1. But if the plate is quite thin, which is an interesting case, t is a hundredth, then the convergence is delayed for a long time. And it wouldn't be until we got here that it would tend to go down. So that's called locking. And it made these elements fairly useless. <coughs> so where does this come from, from our point of view of stability and consistency? Well, I told you this method is, co is coercive. In fact, when the plate gets, t gets smaller, it gets more coercive. So stability is not an issue. So there's only one thing left. It must be um, consistency. But consistency is just approximation by the finite elements. Piecewise linears have good approximation. So what's the answer? Well, actually, the consistency error is the approximation error times the norm of the bilinear form. And this bilinear form involves a t to the minus 2 in it. 
So there's a large factor into the consistency error. So the locking of standard finite elements for the rising and minimum plate is a consistency error in this sense. How could you solve this? Well, our approach is to use a mixed method. You introduce the shear stress, which is this quantity, as a new variable. You rewrite the bilinear form now in terms of three variables, theta, w, and zeta. And now t enters in a much more harmless way. As t goes to zero, nothing blows up. The difficulty is it's now not clear how to find stable elements. And I guess some of the simplest stable elements were ones found by Rick Falk and myself in 89. For theta, we used piecewise linears, but added a bubble function to help us stabilize them. For w, we had to introduce a conformity error. These are piecewise linears that are only continuous at midpoints of edges. So that introduces some more consistency error, but we were able to show it's controlled. It goes to zero. And we used piecewise constants for zeta. And we showed this is stable and consistent. And you see, now we have nice second order convergence, whether t is 1 or 0.01 or anything you want. And then came along another interesting example. Uh, Eugenio Onyate and his group from Barcelona, actually, he came to me and he said, well, we have an element that might even be simpler. And we've tested it and it works great. And why don't you prove that it converges, since you're a mathematician? And he reversed what we did. He used non-conforming linears for theta and conforming linears for w, got rid of our bubble function. And he didn't use piecewise constants for zeta. He used these sort of Rabiartoma things. And they did some experiments and declared that this was a good element. However, we tried to analyze it, looking for consistency and stability. And we found out that there's a stability problem. The imp sup constant behaves like the smaller of 1 and h squared over t squared. So if t is smaller than h, it's bounded away from 0. It's like 1, no problem. But if h is much smaller than t, you have a problem. So here's his results. They're exact opposite from the standard locking. The standard locking works if t is 1, but doesn't work if t is small. The Yati elements work if t is small, which is the only case he tested, because it's the most interesting case and the hardest case. But they don't work if t is equal to 1. They're inconsistent because it turns out that the, the error you put here, the conformity error you put here, is not so easily controlled as the conformity error that you put here. So <coughs> I think the, the viewpoint of consistency and, and stability really illuminates these three different behaviors in a way that wouldn't be obvious just by looking at the experiment and the numerical method. And I'll just point out that if you take the equivalent problem on a curved surface, like a cylinder or a more complex shell, a thin shell, still there is no solid choice of numerical methods, which is certifiably uh, co convergent, both consistent and stable, for a wide range of conditions. In special conditions, there are. But in general, this is still an open problem. OK. And what I want to do with uh, the last I guess, 10 minutes, I guess, I have uh, is talk about my baby, the finite element exterior calculus, and uh, which is one way to develop stable finite element schemes. <coughs> so I, this takes off from, we already saw that it's very useful to look at um, finite elements from the point of view of Hilbert spaces. Here we move from single Hilbert spaces to complexes of Hilbert spaces. And just like uh, we have the Laplacian in mind, for standard finite elements in the space H1, here we have the Duram complex in mind, and the space H1, H curl, H div, and L2. So in 3D, that's what we get, where H1 is the natural domain of the gradient, which maps functions into H curl, things in L2, whose curl is also in L2. And the curl maps those into H div, and uh, things in H L2 whose divergence is in L2. It, whose curl is divergences in L2, and the divergence maps those into L2. And these are complexes in the sense that curl of grad is 0 and div of curl is 0. Here's it in 1D, 2D, 3D. And it's probably illuminating to think of about it as ND. These are just differential k forms. So these are called 0 forms, 1 forms, 2 forms, up to n forms. And all these operators are just special cases of what's called the exterior derivative. Um, which can be defined in general. And sort of the key philosophical idea that's behind this is that when you're dealing with 
say H curl, you should expect to have to use different finite elements than you're dealing with H1. You need finite elements that are suited to the type of space and the type of operators you're dealing with. And in physics, different quantities, exterior calculus was exactly developed because different quantities are different kinds of differential forms. So for example, things that you measure by <coughs> taking a value at a single point, like a temperature, uh, electric potential, are called zero forms. Well, things that you measure by integrating along a curve are one forms, like an electric field you uh, measure by taking a charge and pushing it along a curve and seeing how much work that takes. So that's a one form. Things that you measure over a surface, like a flux, a heat flux, or a stress, are two forms. And things that you measure by integrating over a volume are three forms. Maxwell understood this very well, that although we tend to treat uh, one forms and two forms both as vectors, we heat flux, the, gradi uh, the gradient of U, heat gradients, temperature gradients, we think of as vectors, and, one f uh, and, and fluxes, uh, sigma, which is proportional to it, we think of as vectors. They're really very different kind of vectors. That's what Maxwell was saying in this equation here. And so in the finite element exterior calculus, we try to fit functions to uh, the right kind of finite elements for the right kind of objects. So we need a PDE, and there are many PDEs that come out of a complex like this. There are, of course, almost all of mathematical physics can be expressed in terms of grads, curls, and divs. Um, the simplest one, in some sense, is the Hodge Laplacian, which in terms of differential forms, you have a differential k minus one forms, k forms, and k plus one forms. The d operator goes left, you take the adjoint operators which go right, and then you can take d d star plus d star d. Um, so that would be something like curl curl minus grad div in some cases. Uh, <coughs> and then we're going to talk about trying how to solve this numerically. So the first choice is between what kind of weak formulation if we're going to use finite elements. So one possibility would be to use this sort of obvious weak formulation. Take this equation here, multiply it by a test function v, integrate, integrate the first d over by parts and the first d star over by parts, and you get this. And then the space you have to deal with is this h lambda k intersect h star lambda k, something like h curl intersect h div in one case. Another possibility, which I'll much favor, is the weak formulation, where you introduce as a new variable sigma equals to d star u. So then the equation becomes sigma equals d star u, and d sigma plus d star du is f. And you multiply by test functions. This first equation tells us sigma is d star u, and the second equation tells us d sigma plus d star du equals f. The reason I like this is because the spaces we have to deal with are just the h lambda cases, h curl, h div, but not h curl intersect h div. And the reason is because I can't find decent finite elements for these spaces that are intersections. To show you what I'm talking about, look at this example. <clears throat> Take the vector Laplacian in, th in 3D or ND. So the problem is curl curl minus grad div with some natural boundary conditions. Um, <clears throat> then the weak formulation would use this space h curl intersect h0 div, while the mixed weak formulation would just use h1 and h curl. If I go to the first formulation, which seems so simple, curl u, curl v, div u, div v, I have to find finite elements which exist, which belong to both h curl and h div. It's easy to see that a piecewise polynomial belongs to h curl intersect h div only if it's continuous. So I'm basically forced to use continuous piecewise polynomials. And this is what happens when you compute. This is the exact solution, and this is what happens if you approximate it with piecewise polynomials. You get entirely the wrong solution. And what's the origin of this? Well, by now, we can do it by process of elimination. This is clearly a coercive bilinear form, so it's stable. So it must be inconsistent. It's the only thing that's left. Why is it inconsistent? Well, consistency error is basically approximation error. And the approximation error, well, it turns out that there are functions in h curl intersect h div which cannot be approximated by any h1 function, much less a piecewise polynomial in h1. So um, we don't have consistency. So back to the drawing board, mainly back to this mixed weak formulation. 
So now, for the mixed weak formulation, we have to come up with finite elements in these spaces, in that example, H1 and H curl. Well, those are standard places for finite elements, but the question is, can we choose them so they're stable with this bilinear form? So that becomes the main question. What are the properties that these spaces, subspaces, have to have to make sure that this is consistent and particularly stable? And now I, I better just rush through this quickly. So the theory of this finite element exterior calculus identifies two key properties besides the approximation property that you need for consistency. One is that you have to have a subcomplex so that the exterior derivative of your H1 space has to be contained in your H curl space, or your D of DK minus 1 has to be in DK. And the second is if you write down the Duram complex here and your subcomplex here that you're using, there have to exist projections downward that commute with the D operator, that D pi is equal to pi D. And under those assumptions, you can prove basically everything that you would like to happen happens, and in particular, you get a stable Galerican method. And how do you come up with spaces that have these properties? Well, if you do it for the Duram complex, there's a key role for something called the Kazool differential. It turns out that there are <coughs> two spaces of finite elements to use for the space H lambda k, one of the spaces is polynomial k forms of degree r with just the continuity that you need to be in h lambda k. And the other is something I call pr minus, which is defined in terms of this other one as polynomials of degree r minus 1 k forms plus this Kazool operator applied to polynomials of degree r minus 1 k plus 1 forms. And I don't have time to go into it in, in any detail, but this Kazool operator is operations like crossing with the vector x1, x2, x3, or dotting with the vector x1, x2, x3, or something like that, depending on the situation, on which kind of form. And we also gave degrees of freedom for the finite element spaces um, that use these shape functions. And we proved that they had the right properties, that they formed subcomplexes with commuting projections based on these degrees of freedom. And so here's what you get. Here's one of the two families of finite elements that you could use for polynomial k forms. It works in any number of dimensions, one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions. You get it for k forms for any k. k is 0, 1, 2, up to n. And you get it for any polynomial degree. r equals 1, 2, 3 is shown here, and that we could keep going. These are these pr minus spaces. And what are they? Well, the first column is very familiar. It's just the Lagrange finite elements. So that construction just gives us back the well-known Lagrange finite elements. The last column is also familiar. It's just the full polynomial spaces, but with no continuity. So it's the discontinuous Galerkin finite elements. This middle one in two dimensions, those are the Rabiartoma elements, the lowest order case and the higher order cases. So they fit by the same construction. And these things are called the Nedelec elements. These are what were used in that calculation with 10 billion elements, the face elements and the edge elements for H div and H curl. So these things were developed at many different times, but they all fit in the same construction using the Kazool operator. And then there's the second, oh, and by the way, Whitney, who's a topologist, had actually invented these much earlier in the case R equals 1, not for finite elements, but to use in uh, analysis of differential forms and to prove Duram's theorem. Then there's the, this is the second family of finite elements, not PR minus PR. These also give you the Lagrange elements, so nothing new for R equals 0. They also give you the DG elements, so nothing new for uh, K equals N. But they give you something new for one forms in 2D. These are called the Bretzi Douglas Marini elements from 85, and these are the Nedelec elements of the second kind from 86. So all these come out of the same basic construction. And Sullivan had used these things in topology also. And then finally, I'll close on, there's the question of cubical finite elements. And there are two main families there also. One uses tensor product construction, which I don't mention, and the other one, um, <coughs> which I worked out with Awanu in 2012 is the extension of serendipity elements to differential forms of degree higher than zero. Uh, 
and this is that family over there. The first column is the serendipity elements, including our generalization to higher dimensions, and the other columns are new. These were not known before for the most part. The last column is obvious, but the, uh, the middle ones are not. And so you can put this all together, and you've probably seen my periodic table of finite elements. Now you know what it is. It's PR minus, and PR, the simplicial elements, and then these tensor product, QR minus, and then these new serendipity SR elements on cubes. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Uh, I'll put that up while questions are on. Thank you. Can this be uh, extended to like polyhedral element or other? So that's a very hot topic these days. There's a lot of people working on this topic. Among them, Andrew Gillette, Michael Floater. I just saw a new paper in the archive yesterday that I didn't recognize the authors and I haven't read. And Snorra Christensen in Oslo, he's introduced something he calls finite element systems, which formalizes a little bit further this construction of degrees of freedom and shape functions allows arbitrary shapes. Um, it's done right. He uses uh, inverse limits from homological algebra and stuff like that. It's hard for many people to read, but it's actually very nice stuff. And he's doing some stuff also with Francesca Rapetti. So lots of people are working on that. But I'll, I'll just point out that this is not such an obvious qu question. Um, even if you ask, well, what are the right H1 elements on a, he on a pentagon, for example? Well, there's several different ways to do it. Um, there's the virtual element crowd, there's generalized barycentric coordinates and so forth, but it's not all clear. But I think what is clear is that the people who are doing it by thinking of whole sequence of complexes of K-forms are getting a lot more guidance from the structure than the people who are t doing it a case at a time. We'll talk at the... <clears throat>